if I told you I can make you an Olympic champion and all you needed to do was take one pill, would you take it? But there's a catch. Once you become the champion, you die. Does that change your answer? In the late 80s and early 90s, Robert Goldman asked athletes in sports like fighting, weightlifting and sprinting if they would take a drug once, they would guarantee them victory in every sport enter for the next five years. Everything from the Olympic decathlon to Mr. Universe. More than half the athletes said yes, even though they would know they would die at the end of those five years. Elite sport is all consuming. Athletes have such a small window of time to reach their goals of being the best. They want to maximize their performance using the best training methods and monitor their nutrition closely to ensure they can perform at 100% every day. Some athletes, however, go so far as to put their long-term health at risk and use performance-enhancing drugs all to get the edge on the competition or just to keep up with an already enhanced field. I often wonder, how did sport get here? When did we go from the Olympic creed of the most important thing in the Olympic Games is not to win, but to take part, just as the most important thing in life is not the triumph, but the struggle? To the likes of two things scare me. The first is getting hurt, but that's not as scary as the second which is losing. Elite sport is now valued at over $1.6 trillion per year. Athletes are now icons forever in the forefront of our day-to-day -day lives for their sporting prowess or as models for spokespeople at companies. We have footballers earning hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and Usain Bolt took home $10 million a year from Puma, and in 2016 netted a tidy $32 million, taking home $2.5 million in race winnings and appearance fees. This kind of financial incentive alone will be enough for many to set aside their fair play morals, just to ensure their future. Sport can even play into political power. Take the recent Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, for example, where we saw decades of animosity between North and South Korea set aside, even if only temporarily, in a show of Olympic diplomacy. For some countries, their political standing and international image is linked to the most successful sports, such as their performance at the last World Cup or their medal tally at the most recent Olympics. It's factors like this that contribute to the formation of state-sponsored doping programs such as what's been uncovered in Russia as a result of evidence from athletes and the Oscar-winning documentary Icarus. But is this only sport of the modern era? Or really, have the top levels of sport always been this way? History tells us that the ancient Olympians used to eat magic mushrooms and animal hearts to improve their performance. In the 1920s, strychnine, heroin, caffeine and cocaine were the performance aids of choice. Now, for the modern athlete, I'm not so sure mushrooms or heroin would help them all that much. But what we do see is athletes taking a dizzying array of drugs, ranging from derivatives of testosterone and steroid hormones to peptide hormones like growth hormone and EPO. On top of that, there are stimulants like amphetamines, compounds to open up your bloodstream, and drugs like beta blockers to stop tremors and alleviate stress. Really, there is a drug for everything, and with many of them being naturally occurring, you can imagine detecting them is incredibly difficult. Currently, the World Anti-Doping Authority, or WADA, uses the latest analytical techniques to search for these compounds in urine samples of athletes. As you can see, it's quite the number. And many of these are only slightly different from their natural counterparts, are present for a short time in the blood or at extremely low concentrations in the urine. It's all very much like the molecular needle in a haystack. But as if we've learned more about doping, we've learned more about its effects on the body and through that derived a set of biomarkers that, when taken together, can be used as an indirect measure of doping. This is known as the Athlete Biological Passport, a set of biological variables that, when measured routinely over time, can reveal the effects of doping in a broader sense, rather than attempting to detect the specific method or substance. This biological passport can be integrated into the larger framework of a robust anti-doping program to help better target athletes for specific analytical testing. It's here where we encounter one of the major problems with bringing doping and sport to an end, testing the right athletes at the right time for the right molecules. Performance enhancing drugs and their indirect biomarkers are incredibly short-lived, some a few hours, many a maximum of a few days. So even if the right athlete is tested, the timing may not be correct. Water oversees over 350 sporting federations from all over the world, covering everything from the Olympics to chess. That's millions of athletes at these semi-professional to elite levels. Monitoring all these athletes is incredibly difficult, so the chances of testing an athlete inside that window are exceptionally small. To aid in this, Water uses ADAMS, 
the anti-doping administration and management system. It's a web-based data tool where athletes in the so-called testing pool are required to log a diary of their whereabouts for one hour every day between 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. This doesn't have to cover every 24-7 of the movement of the athletes, but only regular or recurring activities. But knowing where all these athletes are doesn't mean they can all be tested, as there are simply just too many. And on top of that, testing is incredibly expensive. Depending on the type of sample or test required, it can cost as much as $1,500. In 2016, all told, Water tested over 300,000 samples, coming in at a cost of over $200 million. However, with such small detection windows and with many of these indirect biomarkers requiring multiple tests per athlete per year to identify trends, you can imagine that even with such a strong testing and intelligence present, there are still some athletes that can evade, evade current sampling protocols. What we really need is a way to test more athletes more intelligently and more frequently to get inside these detection windows at key times during a season and do so in a cheap and effective manner. So as a scientist and a sports fan, I wondered, what can we do to address this? I work in the field of synthetic biology, a relatively new field of research that lives at the intersection of biology, chemistry, computer science, and engineering. Now, as bio synthetic biologists, we try not to see nature as being messy and random, but as being more like a machine, like a computer, with discrete parts and processes and a nice hierarchy, such as where tissues and cell cultures can be thought of as networks, cells like computers, metabolic pathways like processes, right down to the biochemical reactions and individual protein and DNA molecules that behave like switches and physical components like transistors. When you look at biology like this, you start to see it as one great big machine with an array of parts and components that can be used in new combinations that we can then use to build new biocomputers designed to suit our needs. What can synthetic biology really offer us by re-engineering and redesigning biology? What we've shown is we can engineer plants, bacteria, and yeast to produce biofuels, next generation medicines. We can redesign foods like bananas to be high in vitamin A and iron. We can convert computer data into genetic code, create synthetic organs, or design biosensors and diagnostic devices that can detect specific molecules of interest. Now that could work, but how do we take synthetic biology out of the lab and put it to work in anti-doping? Well, where I work in the Alexandrov lab, we use these synthetic biology principles to build these biosensors, biology-based devices that can create an observable output such as light or electrical current when a molecule of interest is present. But you're probably wondering what a biosensor looks like. Does anyone know someone with diabetes where they routinely measure their blood sugar using a device called a glucometer? Well, then that little testing strip is a biosensor. It's actually a chemical reaction catalyzed by an enzyme where glucose is converted into another molecule and in doing so, releases an electron. Now this can be detected by a nearby electrode as current. And so in this system, the amount of current produced is directly proportional to however much glucose is present in the blood. Such a simple and elegant system. These types of biosensor were first invented in the 1960s and are essentially unchanged in principle today. What's more, they're incredibly cheap. The test strips where the biosensors and electrodes are on, where the blood is applied, cost less than 50 cents to manufacture. These types of tests are called point of care, where the sample is taken and analyzed at the same time, giving real-time information to the patient. This is such a simple and powerful technology, right? If only there was a way to make it useful for measuring blood sugar. Don't reinvent the wheel. Re-engineer it. That's what the Alexandrov group has done. By looking past the hardware down to the nanoscale biology that is doing all the heavy lifting, they were able to re-engineer that enzyme in glucometers to respond to almost any new target molecule. Rather than looking at the biology as a messy amalgamation of amino acids moving randomly in space, as synthetic biologists, they thought of it as a machine, as something that moves and behaves predictably. Now, in nature, there is a function of proteins called allosteric where the activity of an enzyme or protein can be turned on or off, depending on the conditions of its environment. This tells us these molecules can exist in different states that are important for their function. So if you're a synthetic biologist, you would see the possibility of synthetic allosteric, allowing you to control the activity of an enzyme, say the one in glucometers, on your terms. By looking at its molecular structure, they are able to do just that, 
and have inserted a tunable molecular on-off switch into the glucometer enzyme. Now, this molecular switch behaves exactly as you might expect, where on the left, in the absence of an activating molecule, stay a steroid hormone or growth factor, the switch is open and so puts the enzyme in the off or an active state. However, in the presence of our activating steroid hormone or growth factor, the switch is flipped and puts the enzyme in the on or active state, meaning glucose can now be processed and electrical current produced. What this means is that in that essentially identical system, rather than measuring blood sugar, we're now measuring a completely new target. This is a good example of the power of synthetic biology, where by focusing on the molecular elements of these devices, we can ensure that the hardware and production methods remain unchanged. The testing strips, electrodes, and monitors are all the same, meaning these biosensors can be integrated directly into existing technology, greatly reducing costs and the time it takes to go from the lab to the product. Using this kind of approach, we could take analytical techniques for a range of biomarkers from the lab to the pocket, and sample sizes from mils to microliters. So I wondered, could we make point of care, point of athlete? Could we take the synthetic biology adapted technology and use it as a cost-effective means to detect doping in sport and help remediate the doping culture, ensuring those that are clean can compete and those that are doping are core? What might that look like? I mentioned that intelligence is a key tool in anti-doping, where gathered information helps to better target athletes and the specific tests to conduct. If the point of athlete approach was used, we could measure key biomarkers in the blood that, if elevated, strongly indicated the use of performance enhancing drugs. The information can then be used to identify a specific set of athletes to be taken away for specific lab testing. For example, at every sports event or even training sessions, the athletes could be lined up and a drop of blood taken to measure these biomarkers. This can then improve, identify anomalous levels of these biomarkers and improve the targeting of their testing. At one dollar per test, when compared to the conventional testing in the lab at fifteen hundred dollars, we could screen over one thousand athletes for potential doping and require only a droplet of blood per athlete to do it. What's more, these devices are cloud-enabled via mobile device connectivity, meaning the data can be collected and collated, allowing us to generate individualized biological data for each athlete and the elite population as a whole, improving test accuracy and helping identify long-term trends in these biomarkers that could give insights into periodized doping schemes. The idea isn't to replace these lab, robust lab testing schemes, at least not yet, but to make them more effective and complement them. To re-engineer the Olympic motto, our point of athlete tests can make anti-doping faster, cheaper, tougher. If implemented, the point of athlete tech could allow for the testing of almost all competing athletes anywhere, anytime, at one one thousandth of the cost, getting data for a range of biomarkers over long periods of time. Initially, we're targeting biomarkers relating to growth hormone doping, as it's one of the most prevalent practices. However, the beauty of the synthetic switch means that we can push forward and expand to testing almost the entire biological passport and specifics in performance enhancing drugs. This anti-doping tech, though, isn't just limited to anti-doping. With the point of athlete approach, you could see a path to natural athlete 2.0. Many of the biomarkers that are important for anti-doping are also useful for high performance, along with a whole plethora of other molecules in your blood, sweat, tears, and saliva. It's widely regarded that one of the most important factors for improved athletic performance is improved technology and training methods. So it's possible that with the real-time data we can get from these point athlete tests, we could get a greater understanding of nutrition and training methods at the molecular level helping us to naturally go beyond the limits of the seemingly impossible for human performance, things like the sub two hour marathon or the 9.2 second 100 meters. When we look at biology like an engineer would a machine, we can take the components nature offers us and build new molecular machines that can integrate into existing digital technologies, helping us to get the tools we need to understand more about our world at the molecular level. For me, I see the potential to ensure fair and clean sport while also helping us to understand more about our individual metabolisms and physiologies. So with that, I want to leave you with two quotes that have really resonated with me, that have helped lead me to this point, and I think serve to keep you thinking on what is achievable. The first is from my watershed moment in sport doping, and the other is very much how synthetic biologists and athletes alike see the world. Extraordinary allegations require extraordinary evidence. 
and the limits of the possible can only be defined by going beyond them into the impossible. Right now, we have the knowledge and the tools to do this, to create the devices that can provide that extraordinary evidence, and perhaps naturally go beyond the limits of the possible, helping humans run faster, jump higher, live stronger.